ahead and get started. So, um, Mike, would you want to go ahead and show us uh, an equipment safety video that you and Emily put together? Sure, absolutely. So just a little bit of background on the video you're about to see. Um, Emily and I put together this, uh, this last summer this video on PTO safety specifically. Um, it's a demonstration that we've done a number of times uh, at Farm Fest here in Minnesota, but also at a number of Farm Safety Days. Um, in there also you will, um, there's a really quick uh, interview with her dad and her brother, just really short, but um, they were in uh, very serious farm accidents as well. Uh, so kind of prep yourself for that, but we'll, we'll jump right in here. Extension Educator in Farm Safety and Health with University of Minnesota Extension. Today, we're going to be demonstrating and discussing PTO safety. PTOs, or power takeoffs, are an incredibly useful tool for hooking up tractors to implements. However, they are also one of the biggest dangers on the farm. So today, we'll review the parts of the PTO and how to practice safety while a PTO is hooked up. A power takeoff shaft is used to transfer power between tractors and implements. The PTO and its drive shaft rotate at 540 or 1,000 revolutions per minute. According to the National Agricultural Safety Database, most PTO accidents occur when clothing or limbs are entangled in the rotating shaft. Most PTO accidents actually occur when the PTO shaft is rotating at slower speeds. is of three main parts, the drive line, the telescoping shaft, and the universal joints. The drive line guard is also comprised of three major parts, the bearing, the tube, and the bell. Now when applying a guard to a drive line, you start by putting on the bearing, which is going to fit at the top by the universal joints. The purpose of the bearing is to help hold the other two parts in place. Next, you apply the tube, and the tubes are also telescoping, so it's important to make sure you are putting the correct tube on the correct shaft. Now, the tubes will be locked into place by the bearings up at the top. Finally, we put on the bells, and the bells will lock into place the tabs on the outside of the bearing. It's important to make sure the bells are properly attached, otherwise the shaft could rotate while you're using the equipment. Lastly, put the telescoping shaft together and your guard is fully applied and on. As I mentioned before, entanglement is the most common type of PTO accident. One way to prevent entanglement is to tie up long hair and put a hat on. So along with tying back long hair, whenever we're operating farm equipment, we also want to keep some other things in mind including avoiding wearing loose, torn, or too large clothing as it can get caught in different parts and pinch points. And also, whenever you're working with a PTO or any hooked up farm equipment, even if there is no PTO, never step over the shaft. Always walk around. Along with tying back long hair, wearing close-fitting clothing, and walking around the shaft and sitting over it, it's also important to keep all components of the PTO shielded and guarded, and disengage the PTO and shut off the tractor before approaching the shaft to clean, repair, service, or adjust. You should never be working on a PTO as it is rotating. No matter how fast you are, the PTO is faster. Remember, PTO goes at two speeds, 540 revolutions per minute, or about 9 per second, or 1,000 revolutions per minute, about 16.6 per second. As you can see here, I have rotated the shaft nine times, and in that nine times, I have completely wrapped up the tie suit. Let's take a look at it in action. Dad 
Dad, Dale, and my brother, Jake. Uh, and they are a big reason that I do this farm safety work, actually. Uh, so my dad lost his leg in a farming accident when he was 19. And my brother uh, lost his arm in an agricultural accident as well. Because this is what can happen if you're not careful around farm machines. So yeah, thank you for, for watching that. Yeah, that's a pretty powerful video and a really good reminder of just one of the many dangerous mm -hmm. um, pieces of equipment or parts of the equipment is such as the PTO or the power takeoff shaft. And I think Emily's story really uh, reiterates why she is so passionate and, and same with you, Mike, with your stories. And so I really want us to get started because we have so many more stories to share. And we've got a great panel from North Dakota today. And I'd like to go around and have everyone introduce themselves and starting with Scott and Elizabeth Husel. So please, please share a little bit about yourselves this morning. Hi, we're uh, Scott and Elizabeth, and we have a Ridgeline Farm. We're just uh, south of Aneta, and we farm in, in uh, uh, a few different counties right here. And we raise, uh, actually on our plan for this year, we have six different crops. We have malting barley, spring wheat, uh, canola, pinto beans, soybeans, and corn. So we raise a pretty good mix. We have... Uh, we have three full-time employees, and then during the, the growing season, starting the spring, we bring on another three uh, seasonal workers uh, to take us through the busy season. So that's a quick snapshot of our farm. Awesome. Thank you both. We'll be hearing more and learning more of your operation shortly. Also with us this morning, we have David Kraft. David, would you want to share a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, I grew up in the Devil's Lake area, um, was raised on a small farm, about a thousand acres. And um, my dad lost his arm when I was 12 years old in a baler accident. And uh, we lived in Minneapolis for six years, um, working in manufacturing. Uh, I was involved in safety with about four or five different companies, um, facility management and safety. And then in 2015, I started working for Workforce Safety and Insurance as a safety consultant, and I cover the Lake Region area here. Um, been doing that for about uh, five, six years. Um, so we've got lots to talk about. That's kind of all I'll share for now, but thanks, Angie. Awesome. Thanks, David. And last, but certainly not least, the, the hardest working on Ridgeline Farm, right? We, we have Ridgeline Farm employee, Chase Frederick. Chase, would you want to introduce yourself this morning? Hi, I'm Chase Frederick. Uh, I live in Sharon, North Dakota, and I work for Scott Husel. Awesome. So he does not give himself enough credit. I'm just going to say that up front. But yes, so thanks. Thanks, everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, earlier when we were docking, there's so many things that we want to share. So we're going to go ahead and, and get get started with our panelist discussion. So my first question for is going to be for Scott and Elizabeth. And so you, you kind of briefly touched on some of the crops you raise and, and your overall operation. But can you talk about how you've gotten to the point where you have intentional weekly safety meetings and demonstrations for your employees on the farm? Yeah, I'm going to take over from here. Uh, <laughs> So the safety program that we have at our farm, um, it's been an evolving piece. I think it was originally set up before I was there um, to fit into, we have an account with Workforce Safety and Insurance. So it was originally set up to fit into an incentive program under that account. But over time, it's really grown to not simply being just like checking off the list of, yes, we have a program because we follow all the rules that make up our program but it's kind of now more of a fluid piece of the farm where safety has become more of a, what you do, what you think about every day and just jobs that you're doing that day and then overall farm operation. So our program, it has the main goal, of course, is to prevent injuries. That's anyone's main goal. But to have that, I think, set up, I think it's important to have um, safety be something you think about all the time, just part of your normal routine. 
And if you do have a safety program set up, it really helps give a roadmap on how to do that. Um, kind of before and middle and ending where it gives you uh, a plan of how to recognize hazards before they become an injury. And then how to have a plan of whatever we were working on that day, um, how do you do it safely? And then the ending piece, what happens if there is an accident? How do you navigate through that? Um, so it, having a program really helps set that up. So our program has a lot of different pieces. I'm not gonna go through all of the pieces that make up our, our safety program, but I am gonna highlight uh, some parts that we do have. So like I said, we do follow the structure of WSI's safety program or safety management program. And I think David will talk about that soon. But um, underneath that, so I serve as our safety coordinator. And that just means that I work with keeping it all organized. Um, there's some paperwork that gets included into that. So just having one person kind of be in charge and kind of uh, uh, a go-to person if there's any problems or questions. Um, I also work on trying to keep things up to date and do more of the research on finding stuff to train with and events to go to. You mentioned about safety meetings and that's a big, probably one of the biggest pieces of our program, safety meetings. And the idea there is to just keep, they don't have to be a complex thing or take up lots of time. It's the goal of keeping safety in, uh, consistently in your mind and in your conversation and communication among all the employees, having safety being a discussion that's always there. So we have three types of safety meetings that we do. Um, the not so formal one, uh, we just make it a scheduled thing. Every Monday, um, my son and I come out to the farm and we just try to always do a Monday morning meeting. Where for, for a second? Yeah. When she talks about Monday morning meetings, we have meetings every morning. Yeah. So during the summer, we meet every morning at 7 a.m. And during the winter, we meet every morning at 8 a.m. So these are scheduled and, and we have the Monday morning meeting. That's where we talk about safety. Yeah, so and it's good to do it on Monday because it's a time where it's not a formal meeting. Like I said, we just talk about what's going on this week. What are, what's everyone going to be doing? Because you might be doing working on different things. But what you're working on, what are some safety hazards that you should think about before you get to that point? Think about it before it becomes an issue. Um, and then also, that will be a time where we'll do just like a one topic we'll talk, talk about for training. If And that can be like, appropriate for whatever season you're in or something like that, just to give some extra things to talk about. Then another type of meeting that we do, um, in our program, you're supposed to set up with a committee meeting or having a safety committee. Well, we have a small enough group where we had a separate committee for a while, but then we decided we're small enough. I think we should have our safety committee be all of us. And here we have our meetings take more of a formal uh, outline where we have an agenda and we keep minutes. And that's just once a month we do that. And um, having, having the agenda in the minutes fits into our safety program for WSI. It also has a way of keeping um, the conversation relevant and productive so you don't go off on tangents. Um, and then we have two, two, two times a year, we do a bigger meeting where we take that safety committee meeting and of course they go in line with the industry. We have the spring kickoff, and the fall harvest meeting, where those are gonna be a little bit bigger, where we take a little bit more time and actually step through. Those two operations, they come around one time a year. And so, and it's very busy and everyone's working fast and there's a lot of moving parts to it. So before we start, before we jump into spring, we're gonna take one day to go over what are all the moving parts? What are hazards? How do we avoid them before they're a problem? And there might be more people involved then too. Um, different people that we might be working with at that time of the year. So to get everyone on the same page. I'll just, I'll just throw this in there. One year we had our precision A guy, our tech guy from our local dealership come to our safety meeting for prior to spring. So we could talk about some of that stuff, you know, included before we started all the springs work. So yeah, it's, it's great to have other people involved in that. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so at these meetings, you might be curious, what do we actually talk about? And my big goal is when we go there is to have it be worth our time, have it be a beneficial discussion for everyone and um, keeping it relevant to our farm. So one of the things we do is actually, I'll go through the news, what's happened recently? Have there been recent farm accidents? You know, uh, 
just in the agriculture industry. How did it happen? Why did it happen? Could it happen on our farm? How do we avoid that? So that's one thing we'll do. Other things we talk about are just facts and stats. WSI, does, um, they do a report every couple of years, David might mention this too, about claims that have gone through and they give information on um, by industry and it gives lots of interesting facts like down to time of day when most accidents happen or day of the week and so we'll kind of or how accidents happen too like um, you know what was the nature of, of the injury so we'll kind of go through that too and that's kind of interesting to see and how can we prevent injuries on our farm um, we also go through our own data um, I'm always trying to encourage people to report stuff and so it might be kind of seem like a lot of work, but it's actually really beneficial. And a couple times a year, we'll go through, okay, what were injuries or potential injuries that were at our farm that year? How are they going? Have we corrected? If there was an issue, was it corrected? Does it still need to be looked at? Is it still causing a problem? So we can look at our own data too, which is really beneficial. Um, uh, we also talk about PPE a lot, protective, Personal protective equipment. Um, we try to provide what is important for people to have. And then, um, uh, well, I'll say, we also talk about first aid supplies too. Well, if you're going to talk about PPE and first aid, uh, I think it's important to also provide it for your employees. So we try to do that. And PPE is funny because it's talked about all the time how important it is. But unless your people actually know the value of it, like the equipment, are comfortable using it, they won't use it. So we bring it up all the time and I'm asking the guys all the time like, okay, there's you know thousands of types of safety glasses, but which ones do you guys want? Because those are the ones I'm gonna get because I know that you'll wear them. If you have stuff that they don't like or know how to use, then they're not gonna use it. Um, so equipment that we keep uh, would be like safety glasses, earplugs, typical things like that. We do have a first aid area where we have um, any supplies you might need. On our farm, we also have an AED, which is, I think, a huge yeah. piece, um, something that is very vital that could really help. So, And we've had training on the AED. We could ask Chase how many times he's been trained on how to use the AED, but I think all of our employees know how to use an AED. So if somebody were to start experiencing some cardio issues, uh, somebody could apply an AED. Yeah, yep. So that's just it. If you have the stuff, Make sure you guys know how to use it, where it's located. We have fire extinguishers. Does everyone feel comfortable running to one if they need it? How do you use it? So just keeping up with training like that is what we talk about during our meetings. Um, Before you go on, Elizabeth, could yeah. Scott, could you, Scott and Elizabeth, could you remind us how many employees you, you have on your farm or, you know, seasonally? Well, yeah, we've got the three full-time year-round, and then uh, in the uh, busy season, we add, I want to say, three more, three or four more. So when we get to busy time, our, uh, our morning meetings have Elizabeth, and then the key trainer that we have on our farm is our seven-year-old son, Herloff. He does a great job of uh, doing a lot of training. So it's the three of us plus another seven employees and so it's uh um yeah so we have a lot of people there and i think our employees do a great job of talking about things that we're doing this coming week or this coming quarter um or for uh springs work or during harvest of what potential issues we might have um so uh yeah that's that's how many people we have on the farm that's awesome and, and the reason why i wanted to ask that was because size doesn't matter in this case, right? I mean, would you say that holds true whether you just have one employee or like you said, when it gets to be the seasonal uh, harvest or springs work, you're, you're, you're up to seven or so. Uh, how, how, is that, how has that made an impact? I mean, does, does size matter when it comes to safety for you? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, you know, I mentioned before the call that, that uh, we've cut acres this year. Uh, my partner retired. And prior to that, we had an additional two full-time employees um, and uh, a little bit more uh, uh, seasonal uh, workers. But uh, we're, we're just as focused on safety now um, as we were 
two, three years ago. And I think moving forward, we're going to be even more focused um, trying to I mean, of course, it's very hard to plan ahead for something that might happen. Um, but I think we need to we need to continue trying to do that so that, uh, you know, when I'm walking up the or when I'm going to jump out of the combine and I get made fun of about this all the time, that I don't walk down the, the ladder backwards. I got to turn around and grab, you know, three points of contact when you're climbing any ladders, which I have a bad habit of not doing. But, you know. Yeah. No, I, I thought you guys have, just the way you described it, it's a great setup, right? Like, just you you reinforce, you have open conversations, you're bringing other people in, um, you're really working with your, your employees to say, hey, this is the type of equipment that is going to work for you. We need to do something, but we're working with you so, you, so you do it, which I think is great. But one of the things that you mentioned along the way was, was WSI. And, you know, I was wondering if we can pull David in at this point and actually ask David, can you describe what WSI is and, and really how that works for farms and ranches up in North Dakota? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to touch on a couple things that Scott and Elizabeth talked about first. And one of the most important things you can do is set the expectation. So if you're an owner operator of a farming operation, you, you need to have that expectation of this is how we're going to run our operation. You can be professional and talk about these things up front with the employees. Make sure you have that open door policy. So if they have concerns, they're, they're open and they feel comfortable bringing that up because safety can, can get a bad, um, you know, you can, some employers just don't look at safety the same way and it really needs to be addressed from upper management. If you don't have that upper management commitment, you, it's tough to expect your employees to do um, the things that you would like them to do in regards to safety. So really setting that precedence is, is key. So what we do with WSI is we have programs out there. Um, normally they were geared towards general industry and just we got lots of other industries within the state of North Dakota, but they did come out about five years ago and they started an ag initiative. And we, we put together some information just for ag because we know the biggest issue with ag is you, you don't normally have a dedicated person for safety. So there's documentation, there's putting things in place, policies, you know, how do we get this thing started? So what we want to do is I won't say we're, we're the easy button, but we can provide a lot of these resources to you and kind of help explain, you know, this is what we would expect. Um, we have some guidelines out there that's just a good foundation for any business. It doesn't matter if it's ag, it doesn't matter if it's general industry or a hospital, it's just a good foundation. And in those key parts are the safety management program. So it's having the commitment from upper management. Um, it's doing the safety inspections. Um, typically we would want most industries to do a quarterly inspection. When it comes to ag, we've reduced that to one annual inspection a year. Um, so there's, there's checklists that you go around, you might check machine guarding, you might check, um, there's just lots of things when it comes to ag, which is another reason why ag is such an important safety issue because you guys are dealing with a lot of different things. You got chemicals, you got big equipment, you got transportation with, with, uh, with semis and uh, it's just, uh, there's a lot of hazards out there for, for those employers to try to wrap their arms around is difficult for most people when they don't have a safety background. So we just want to provide some of the resources. Um, if there's injuries, we want you to do an accident investigation just to try to get some good information. How did it happen? Why did it happen? It's not to point fingers. It's just to try to figure out what can we do to mitigate a reoccurrence. Um, and then the safety training aspect. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you have fewer than 10 employees, you don't fall under OSHA regs unless they're H2A, then you would fall under OSHA regs. I'm not, I don't want to talk about OSHA much, but um, if, if you're smaller than 10 employees and you don't have H2A visa employees, then OSHA doesn't have any jurisdiction over you. Um, so meeting the requirements are pretty much up to the farmer. I mean, they can kind of put in any safety that they would like. If you have H2A visa workers, then we would recommend kind of checking some of those boxes so you're mitigating a couple of things at one time. Number one is safety. Um, Number two or three or however you want to put them in order, they're not really in order, but safety is number one. And then check some boxes for our program so you can get those discounts. Uh, we offer up to 25% premium discounts. You have a policy with us. And then 
check the box for OSHA because we don't want OSHA, you know, we don't want OSHA fines. We don't want people getting hurt. So what are, what are some of the OSHA regulations? And we can help with that too and kind of just point, point towards some of those things. We're not an enforcement agency. So you can be open to us and say, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what we're currently doing. Um, I could go on and on for an hour here. And I know we don't have a lot of time, but we have other smaller programs too, like the safety committee um, that Elizabeth talked about. It's just, um, if we don't meet monthly, at least monthly, things just seem to get pushed out, especially in regards to safety. So we really just gotta take that time, take a look every month, say, you know, what areas do we need to improve in? Um, where have we made some good improvements? Um, the egg industry um, isn't required to have workers' compensation. They're one of the very few in the state. And, um, you know, it's just, it's how it was set up in 1919. I've got a short video. Is this a good time, Angie? I could play that. It's four minutes. Um, yeah, if you could go ahead and play that. And, and while that's playing, Scott and Elizabeth, I'm going to have a question for you to sit and ponder. So, um, you know, you talked about WSI. I want you, once this video gets done, uh, I want you to share with us why you got involved. I know David may have mentioned a, a piece of it, but, but I want you to share with our group today why you were one of the... Uh, pioneer farms to say, hey, this is something that we need to look into and consider. So yes, Dave, go ahead and please share your video. 1919 was a watershed year in North Dakota politics. World War I, the Great War in Europe, had ended the year before, bringing mechanization and change back to the country. North Dakota soldiers returning home were ready to go back to work and continue the Industrial Revolution. That revolution had brought changes to the workforce. Workers were beginning to leave the farms and were working in sometimes dangerous factory conditions. If they got hurt, maimed, or killed on the job, there was no government program to help them pay for their medical bills or provide a wage replacement to them or their family independence. Beginning in the early 20th century, states began to adopt workers' compensation laws designed to provide a safety net for workmen for on the job. The idea came from Germany in 1884. Otto von Bismarck, chancellor of the German Empire, introduced the programs to assist workers in the event of an accidental injury or illness. This initial workers' compensation system was financed by workers and employers. Not surprisingly then, the German immigrants brought the idea to America in the early 20th century. Wisconsin passed the first comprehensive workers' compensation law in 1911, while Mississippi was the last state to jump on board in 1948. In 1919, the Nonpartisan League was the majority party in the North Dakota legislature. They brought forward a radical legislative agenda of social change for our state. The league created three institutions that year that still resonate strongly in our state 100 years later. The Bank of North Dakota, the North Dakota Mill and Elevator, and the then called Workmen's Compensation Bureau, now known as Workforce Safety and Insurance. The law creating WSI, House Bill 56, was passed in 1919. Nonpartisan league leader William Lemke is given credit for drafting this bill. The original draft of the North Dakota bill was a compilation of provisions from seven state laws and the national workers' compensation law that protected federal workers. House Bill 56 was introduced by State Representative George Malone of McLean County. Representative Malone was a coal miner who served as the secretary treasurer of the United Mine Workers Local 3803 of Wilton, North Dakota. In 1919, Wilton, was home to the largest lignite coal mine in the world. Some 400 miners worked underground in Wilton, digging coal, which was shipped east on the Sioux Line Railroad. House Bill 56 eventually passed both houses and was signed into law by Governor Lynn Frazier on March 3, 1919. Editorials of the day in state newspapers were mostly favorable. The Bismarck Tribune editorial did not like the idea of excluding farmers from compulsory coverage, stating, quote, 80% of all semi-total disability cases occur among farm workers, unquote. Even though agriculture is one of the backbone industries in North Dakota, 
agriculture workers remain exempt from coverage 100 years later. On April 1st, 1919, Governor Fraser announced the appointment of S.S. McDonald and L.J. Weehy as commissioners. The law had placed the Workmen's Compensation Bureau in the Department of Agriculture and Labor and provided that the commissioner of that department would serve as a member and ex officio chairman. When the three commissioners met on April 14, 1919, they voted to rent part of the dining room of the Northwest Hotel in downtown Bismarck at the corner of 5th and Main Streets for its first off. All right, that's all I'll kind of share on the video. The, the reason I played that is, you know, the legislator back then was typically made up of egg producers and they exempt themselves. So they had the right to do that. Um, they are still exempt. But the purpose of workers' compensation was to provide those employees that could get injured while they're working um, with, you know, to have the medical expenses paid and to have the um, work, um, you know, 66% of their wage loss benefits as well. The other thing it did, it did is it was designed to help the employers. So employers that have workers' compensation coverage, if they have an employee that gets hurt at work, it relieves the lawsuit. Um, typically it relieves the lawsuit issues involved with that injury. Um, so we, we do have some egg producers out there. I'm not saying that that's the right reason to have the coverage, um, but if you have that workers' compensation coverage, it both helps the employees and the employer. Um, and then the safety programs that we have designed are there to help kind of get some of that safety going within your company. So we wanna, you know, we're, we're not a, like I said, we're not an enforcement agency and these programs are 100% um, volunteer, you know, it's up to the, they're volunteers. So you can, you can pull out of these programs at any time. It doesn't affect you at all. Um, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. So it's kind of a win-win opportunity for, for those companies that wanna to try to take some of these programs on. Uh, we try to make it as easy as possible. Elizabeth and, and Scott, I mean, they're, they were in this before we even had the Ag Initiative. So, I mean, they've been in it, I don't know for how many years I could go back and look, but it's probably been over maybe 10, 12, maybe even, maybe even further back than that, maybe even 15 years back. Um, so it, it's difficult getting the farm and egg, I would say. They asked this question earlier before the program, but what's the biggest problem on getting egg producers in these programs? One is they're not, they're exempt from workers' compensation. So a lot of them don't even have, you know, policy. And then number two, having the resources so the an employee that can manage this kind of like Elizabeth does I know I'm come from the farm and egg background so I know what producers are dealing with they don't have full-time people like a normal business they've got a secretary they've got an HR person they got somebody that they can kind of have wear multiple hats to where the egg producer they're already wearing multiple hats I mean there's a lot of things they got going on and it's tough to get these safety programs put in place so with these programs that we already have designed um, they might not be perfect, but we don't keyhole you into doing it a certain way. If there's something that works great for you, go ahead and do it. Um, we're fairly flexible. It's not a solid, rigid program. So if we can see that you're making improvements with safety, we want to give you those discounts. Um, we do have some boxes that we have to check. Of course, it is, it is you know, state money. Um, so we can't just be um, you know, having no audit and just give discounts. But um, we're willing to work with you and try to make improvements on your program you know, with your safety programs there on the farm, so. Awesome, hey, thank you, David, very much. I was wondering if we could sw uh, swing back to Scott and Elizabeth just really quick uh, to answer that question. And then I really wanna get to Chase here and uh, get him included as well. Well, basically the, to answer Andy's question, the reason that we got involved with the WSI was to, to uh, kind of uh, provide a little bit of support to the number one asset on our farm, which is our employees. And so that's why we uh, participate in WSI and then the safety management program. Um, the reason that we do that is because we get discounts on our premium and, it, and it, that, that whole program has just been phenomenal for our farm. So that's why, that's why we're doing that. So now I guess I'm going to go ahead and, and get Chase involved in this conversation a little bit more. And thanks for being so patient, Chase. We've had such good dialogue so far. Um, 
I want to ask you and, and kind of get you to talk about experiences because as, as we know, and Elizabeth said, you know, we, we watch the news and, and, and read the papers. I mean, we, we're seeing accidents and fatalities and unfortunately it takes that survivor story to really get people, especially in our ag communities to, to stand up and take notice when it comes to farm safety um, if you're comfortable, would you would you want to share your experience that you went through on uh, working with Ridgeline Farm? Yeah, so <clears throat> on December 19th, 2018, I was involved in a grain bin accident, farm accident. Uh, we were to the bottom of the bin hauling grain so nothing else is coming out so we had to get the grain sweep going in there so there was about four guys in the bin uh, we have the grain sweep going it's going in a circle or whatever we're shoveling sweeping i guess i was just getting really hot and sweaty so i decided to walk to the door take my jacket off so i get there i throw my jacket off i turn back in the door that's when the grain sweep uh got both of my legs drug me about 10 20 feet uh and luckily my dad was there and shut the sweep off or else i probably would have lost at least one leg pretty scary stuff uh but what i got uh, hauled to the hospital at Sanford in Fargo. I was there for a little over two months. Had multiple surgeries. Well, first off, I broke my left ankle. Both of my knees got dislocated. Just lots of, both of my feet got cut up really bad and my legs re got cut up really bad. Had to get skin graft. Um, I pretty much had to learn how to walk again. And um, my left foot still has foot drop or I can't lift it up. Um, I guess those were the worst of my injuries from it. Um, so I was in the hospital for a few months and then after that I had to do rehab or whatever and I was doing that for a couple months and um I learned how to walk again and I I'm doing really good and stuff uh I guess I'm very lucky to still be here and be walking and still be working um but I guess there's one thing I hope for people to get out of this for telling my story is I just hope this prevents at least one person um, not getting injured in a bin or farm accident because it can happen to anybody. It can happen in a split second where, you know, just get it. It's not good. Um, but yeah, I, now from this experience, I've just, Every job I do now, I just take my time and just really think everything through and make sure I'm doing the right thing and not rushing through stuff. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, that's I'm going to chime story. in. Yeah. Go ahead, David. I'm going to chime in real quick on that because it is another, there's a couple things that have, I've always been there with egg and then there's some things that are changing. So the thing that's always been there with egg is the stress, you know, get trying to get crops in, you're dealing with mother nature. Um, you've got typically limited resources. So the, the stress on employees and, and owner operators is, is always going to be there. And we need to talk about the safety aspect, you know, at a, you know, periodically, Typically, we want to schedule that because it isn't something that you can just talk about before an injury is going to happen, of course. We don't know when things are going to happen. But we need to realize that when we're in a hurry, when we're stressed, and when we're fatigued, 
which are three things that you're going to be dealing with that a lot of other industries don't have to deal with, that's when there's going to be more injuries. That's why we really need to take a look at safety on, on the egg side. Um, you know, we want to use the hierarchy of controls. Uh, so some people know about that, but if you can mitigate the injury, mitigate the hazards. So um, if you can eliminate um, the hazard, which is tough to do an egg, um, but if you can, if you cannot have to go into bins, it's going to be safer. So that's an engineering control. An administrative control would be maybe putting, uh, doing some training, of course, with the employees if they do have to enter a bin, having bin entry permits, having lockout tagout procedures, um, and then the last line of defense is PPE. So if you can't do it, you know, if you can't make every, if you can't eliminate those hazards and you can't, um, you know, mitigate it with, sometimes you got to use both the administrative and PPE together. But when you're dealing with the chemicals, when you're dealing with machine guarding, those are things that we really need to pay attention to. Extend, extended rotating shafts are another good topic for this presentation right here, because yeah, you've got, you get the machine guarding issues, you get the PTO guarding. Uh, I think it was last year, the year before I had a guy, um, he was operating a jump auger, a uh, batco, and you know, they had a, on the upper part of the, um, the belt conveyor, there was an extended rotating shaft and he got a sweatshirt caught in there, hydraulic driven orbital motor. Thankfully the farmer was right next to him and he was able to get the tractor shut off, but it dislocated a shoulder and he probably would have lost an arm. If not something that simple on a, I mean, these, these jump conveyors are everywhere and just checking your farm to make sure do we have extended rotating shafts? Do we have guarding over our flightings on any, um, on any of that equipment that we're moving grain with? Um, but I'll hand it back over to, to Mike and Angie. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in there real quick just to kind of continue on, uh, you know, Chase told you what, what had happened in the bin. And I'll be honest, that was, that was one of the scariest days of my life. Um, when that had happened, uh, Elizabeth and I are both both EMTs on the Aneta ambulance, and so I got a call that uh, there was a an accident in Sharon, and so we uh, raced to Sharon, and Ch Chase was already had already left by ambulance uh, by West Trail ambulance on his way to Mayville, and I took Chase's dad, and we drove to Mayville, not not knowing how Chase was doing, and then he got transferred to Fargo. And uh, Rodney and I uh, drove down to Fargo. Just, I mean, I was, it was just super, super scary to, to wonder how Chase was doing. Um, on our farm, everybody took the rest of the day off that day. And that next morning, we had a mandatory meeting at uh, eight o'clock at the farm. And we went through it. Elizabeth came and we, we walked through everything that had happened. Um, and then we, at that meeting, we said, we are never going to go in that bin again. We're not, I mean, in bins that have drag augers, we're never going to be in a bin when the drag auger is running. Again, that was the decision that was made. Uh, and uh, we haven't since. So we'll run the drag auger around the bin, then we'll get in and we'll shovel. And then we'll all get out, run the drag auger again, get in and shovel more and get out and, and run the drag auger again. Um, but, uh, that, that next morning, there was a lot of, uh, uh, there was a lot of emotions going on at that meeting. And so uh, um, it just, uh, that's just something to keep in mind also, but. Uh, but also having your pro having a program in place, having our program in place really helped us just navigate through that. Like um, having our account set up the whole process. I mean, on my end, and I tried to help Chase as much as possible too, uh, working with WSI extremely helpful in all of all of the medical parts that happened after that it was really a really uh i don't want to say an easy process because it wasn't an easy situation but it really helped navigate a time that could be actually very stressful and i was you know i was of course obviously extremely concerned about chase and how you know how his legs were going to be wondering if he's going to be able to work on the farm again and i I, if I'm correct, Chase, you came out at harvest and then you ran the, the combine and, and uh, I don't think my, I don't think my dad is watching, but Chase does a better job of running that 80, 81, 20 than my dad, <laughs> my dad, but uh, no, he does, he does a fantastic job on our farm. And we're just very uh, thankful and uh, feel blessed that he, uh, 
he was one of the lucky ones that was able to recover because we know there's there's other people that aren't as lucky. So. Yeah, there's a couple of things that I want to stress too. Um, you know, you guys had brain bin safety, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. And I just want to stress, you know, put 90% of your effort into prevention and maybe that 10% into, you know, first aid and having maybe some equipment there to, to extract somebody out of the bin. Because by the time you're in that position, you know, things, the outcome normally isn't good. So, you know, I see a lot of these organizations getting together and let's buy equipment, you know, coffer dam things, you know, to, so if somebody's engulfed in grain, those are great. I'm not going to discourage those, um, but really try to concentrate on even putting labels on the front of your bins. I mean, it just educating, just telling the employees what your expectations are um, as far as engulfment goes and other hazards. If they notice something should be guarded, have that open conversation with your employer to say, hey, I think we should get this guarded. You know, I've got to work around it when we're unloading or, or whatever it is. Um, and then the, with the egg industry being, you know, what it is where the equipment is getting so much bigger, um, you got more blind spots, um, things are moving faster. Um, you got, you know, everybody's got semis now, so there's added safety issues there. Um, so things are changing and you just want to be able to have that safety program in place to be able to do your hazard assessment like Elizabeth was talking about, if not weekly, maybe monthly, to take a look at, you know, these are the hazards we have right now. And these are the serious things where, you know, you want to prioritize, of course. So making sure you're prior prioritizing those really high hazard things first, and then you can work your way down. Um, I'm not going to throw, you know, nothing bad about Elizabeth and, and Scott, but they I think they had a small fire. And this was just, uh, you know, having, you know, some things happen. I mean, when you're in a hurry and you're welding or you're doing something in the shop, and it's not that somebody might have gotten hurt from it, but safety also helps reduce your, you know, your risk as far as equipment costs, people, you know, having breakdowns, um, having a fire. So having those fire extinguishers handy, having some sort of, you know, talking to your employees about if you're going to do some welding in the shop, make sure there's no combustibles around or making sure there's a fire extinguisher close by, maybe sticking around. We, you know, there's, there's things out there as far as, you know, hot work goes, you should, shouldn't do it just before break time, you know, do some welding and then leave. Because if there is something that's still hot or can catch on fire, you know, those are, those are still hazards. And um, I'm going to jump in here, David. I, I just see on the Q and a there, Angie, that. Somebody yeah, I was asked... going to start asking questions, but I didn't want to interrupt David. So um, well, one of David the questions. Started, David, David started talking about uh, problems that we've been having <laughs> on our farm. So I just want to interrupt. Him so keep oh, about. got it. Got it. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, awesome. The question is uh, um, about uh, buy-in from employees or get feedback. I can tell you that when we started this uh, 10, 12 years ago, um, trying to have a safety meeting in the morning at the farm was like like pulling teeth. It was, uh, it was very hard to get employees to participate in a safety meeting, um, but I dare I say since Elizabeth has been, uh, has got involved, um, our, our employees actually, and Chase, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that uh, our employees do a great job of being involved because Elizabeth will pose a question because we know what we're doing this coming week. Um, if we're, if we are spraying uh, wheat, and that's the main thing that we're doing that week, we'll talk about all the things that go with that. So Elizabeth, Elizabeth will ask, question you know what's what are the issues in our spray trailer and what, what do we have to be careful with and uh, James will say you know this this and this and Chase would say this this and this and so we get a lot of dialogue going on with our employees and so I think just you know I think it's it is having the right person as a safety director and to have employees that just feel a lot of buy-in I mean I think that they feel like they're part of the the part of the farm so um uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, and, and they do provide, I see the second half of the question, uh, feedback include uh, possible improvements. And, and yes, there are a lot of, we do get a lot of suggestions on our farm for how to do things a little better. So uh, that's uh, very positive. 
So I guess I want to follow up and, and ask Chase a question. So, so um, in the Q&A, Scott had just addressed, you know, is there feedback from you as an employee? But I want to ask you, how has their approach to farm safety impacted you as an employee? I mean, how... How do you view that? How, from your eyes, let's pretend Scott and Elizabeth aren't there. They can't hear you. I want you to be open and honest and, and talk about w- what those meetings and the trainings they do mean to you. Yeah, I don't know. I just think it's made me a better worker because we talk about it every Monday about what we're going to be doing in the safety parts. So it's just, I think it's really good. I think the safety program is really good, and uh, I think it just made me a better worker. Have you learned from them? I mean, yeah. have you have you been doing? You know, if you, were you ever at a point where you were you thought you were doing a task correctly, but because of the work and meetings that they've had and trainings, you yeah. now learned. Oh my gosh, I could do this better. Yeah, a few times that's happened to me where I'm doing something and I'm just think about it. No, we talked about this in the safety meeting. I better do it this way. That's so. awesome. And, and that kind of, um, we're, we're, I wish we had more time, you guys, there's so many questions coming in and, and the next, uh, I wanted to ask Scott and Elizabeth because we've kind of been getting some feedback. How do you, how do you get started in having these conversations? Because like you said, it's, it's like pulling teeth to get this going and people, dang it, we know how to do this. Why are you telling me how to do my job you're paying me to do? So how do you even get, how do you get this conversation started? Um, yeah, to get conversation, it, it is, um, sometimes it's just, like we said about reading the news, these things happen. And unfortunately with farm safety, usually injuries are not going to be small. And so when you read about them, it kind of puts it into, wow, that could happen to us, or we do that same thing. What, you know, what could we do to prevent that? So just seeing what's actually happening out, happening out in the industry, not just on our farm, but that it really is happening everywhere. Okay. Sometimes we try to keep it fun too. Uh, we bring, like we said, we bring our seven-year-old son and People like listening to him more, I think, than to me. So I, ch- I see Chase smiling at that, so I would think he agrees too. <laughs> he gives demonstrations, though. He's brought his toys out to show. He's got his little trucks and how which way you should back up and gives examples that way. Just finding different ways to keep it a little bit lighter and a little bit more fun. We've done prod- or, um, examples where we practice lifi- lifting boxes. What's the proper way to lift a box? And then one time we did that exercise and then they opened up the boxes and there was candy bars inside of the boxes for people. <laughs> it's <laughs> the little candy. things in life, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, no, absolutely. Uh, Angie, we did have a couple other just kind of like technical questions here. I thought we might just be able to answer those really quickly. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, the first one I saw, maybe Angie or David can answer this one. Is there a central database for farm injuries in North Dakota specifically, uh, much like Purdue does? Oh boy. Um, And maybe David, you have a better answer, but from what I I use, uh, farminjurynews.org. That's that's the organization that I use. Um, It's or aginjurynews.org. Thank you for whoever put that in the chat. That's, that's what I use because farm accidents are not required to be reported. Um, and so that is, that's where I, you can select um, any state, any country you want. And basically what that organization does is they sift and pull through any news releases, obituaries, anything that um, has the incidences that uh, that the media had picked up and that's where it records it. So is every incident there? Absolutely not. But there are, that's where I get my data from is, is that aginjurynews.org. Uh, David, specifically, maybe for you, another one here is, are there workers' comp packages that are affordable, you know, relatively speaking, for smaller farms? So, think one, two, three employees. Well, I'm on the safety side, but uh, a couple things I can, I can let you know is uh, WSI is the, is the 
best value in the United States for workers' comp. Um, and then we do have small employer discounts. I think you can get a 10% discount right off the bat um, for smaller employers. And I think that's if your premium is under $5,000. Don't quote me, but, um, you know, I think just roughly, I'd have to look up the rates on farm and egg. Um, it's typically around, I would say around $750 per employee for a year. Um, you, can, you can have the owner operator um, as well. Another good aspect with the egg side is if you're an owner operator and you insure yourself, you're covered pretty much 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because you're always working. Mm -hmm. Whether you're driving to town to get parts and you get in a vehicle accident, whether you're, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, same thing with your employees. If they're working, you know, whatever hours they're working, um, you, you know, so we, they're pretty flexible there on, you know, on covering those um those employees and you know there's there's some things out there and then we've got these safety programs where you can get another 25 percent and then since we're a state-run workers comp state we're nonprofit, so we've been given 50 percent dividend returns i think five years running now four or five years running so whatever you would pay for a premium next year you'd get 50 percent of that back so it's, it's pretty reasonable, I think, but you would have to um, contact WSI and they can get you official quotes for that. There's a question in the Q&A. Oh, yes, I will go ahead. Thank you, Scott. So uh, we'll do one last question and then I want to do a follow, a final message, final word. So panelists be thinking about what's the one thing you really want our attendees to, to walk away with and maybe even try on their own farm. And so this last question, Chase, is for you. And so Chase, knowing that accidents happen, um, did you, did you think or know you were doing anything wrong on the day of your accident? And had the grain sweep safety been expressed to you or, or at a meeting with you prior to your incident? Yeah, so I didn't think I was doing anything wrong at the time till a few days later. But, uh, no, before we got in that bin that day, we talked about just be careful, I guess. That's about it. Okay. Well, so. thank you. Thank you for that question. And thank you for your answer. And to wrap us up, because we are just afternoon, I want to be conscious of everybody's time. Uh, Scott and Elizabeth, any last words to share with us? I think uh, that's what I'd like to share is that. You may need to get a little closer to your computer. There we go. Hear me now. There we go. Um, the thing that I'd like to share is that um, you know, growing up farming many years, we just, we know how to do, I mean, we think we know what we're doing all the time. We think we're safe all the time, but that's not true. I mean, it, it, it actually takes a diligent effort to, um, to talk about safety, to think about safety, to make sure that we are doing things right. And like Chase just said that now, while he's working on something, it'll just pop into his head that, wait a minute, I should think about doing it this way because I know it's, it's safer. So I think just thinking about safety more often, just dedicating time to uh, putting that through your mind is, uh, would be a great advantage to your farm, to your relationships and to your lives. It's a, it's a, it's a big deal. I love that you're being proactive about it because your message that I just took from that is, it shouldn't take a farm accident for you to start taking attention and paying attention to farm safety. So that was very powerful. Thank you for sharing. And Chase, do you have any comments you'd like to share with our group? Uh, not really, I guess. No. <laughs> That's okay. We're, we're very thankful for you yeah. to share your powerful story. So that's, um, that really hit home for a lot of our individuals that joined us today. So thank you for sharing. And any last words for David? From me or for me? <laughs> From you. Well, I just want to, you know, like Scott said, the more we talk about it, the more likely employees are going to recognize that they should probably, you know, do things a little differently. If we're out there every day and we're just pounding the guys, we got to get this done. We got to move that. We got to be over here. 
that's what they're going to um, focus on. So we have, I, we see it in construction, we see it in other industries. If the owner is out there and all he's concerned about is getting things done, just get it done. What's gonna suffer? Safety is gonna be one of the top things that's gonna suffer. So I'm not telling people they gotta take twice the amount of time to get everything done because that's not how it works. But the more we talk about it, the more likely that person is gonna make the decision themselves, which is what we want. We want the safety culture to improve. We don't want have to have to have um, Scott and Elizabeth out there every day telling these guys, okay, you should maybe do it this way. We want them to realize that these are the expectations of our business and this is how we want you to do it and then to have them make that decision. Awesome. Well, Mike, what a fantastic panel this afternoon. I wish we would have had more time. Do you have any closing thoughts? You know, my, my biggest thing is take away from this, you know, my, my thing is what are the small things that we can do that give us the biggest return on safety? Having conversations, taking that five extra minutes, the five extra seconds to think about what you're doing before you do it, uh, gives us the biggest return on our safety. So always keep that stuff in mind and keep moving forward. Excellent. And I guess one thing I would like to say is that we hope that you see NDSU Extension and, and University of Minnesota Extension. We want to be right there with you. And, and we hope that we're a powerful resource when it comes to your farm and ranch safety programming as well. And, and so with that, I am going to go ahead and, and end this webinar. I want to thank you.